Tonight we're going to look uh, just for a, a little bit back at lesson six. I appreciate Pastor Bob Nilge's leading you in my absence two Wednesday nights ago. I want to begin this evening by reviewing a little bit of what he taught to you two Wednesday nights ago and uh, as well spend a little bit of time. He rushed, rushed, rushed through that message. I watched the message on, on uh, live stream and uh, he, he did not get to everything uh, a couple of Wednesday nights ago. So I want to take a little bit of time to focus on a couple of portions that he uh, was unable to get to last Wednesday night and then we're ready to move on to Hebrews Uh, lesson number seven as well tonight, and you have that outline before you as well. So we'll get to where we get this evening. I remind you as we uh, get back into the book of Hebrews tonight that the book of Hebrews is a book of comparisons and contrasts, that we start the book of Hebrews and spend much time in the book of Hebrews uh, uh, understanding and reminding ourselves that Jesus is a whole lot better than anything or anybody else that's ever been. Everybody say, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And that, for that reason, we have titled this series on Hebrews, Bigger, Better, Brighter, and Bolder. Because Jesus and His new covenant... The covenant made possible through the shedding of his own blood on the cross of Calvary, the shedding of the blood of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because of this new covenant, we have a brand new kind of relationship with God. We are no longer his children simply by, uh, you know, a covenant of law. Now we are his children by a covenant of grace and adoption where we've been welcomed into the family of God and we have become full-fledged members of the family of God. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ as we studied in Romans not long ago. And the book of Hebrews reminds us again and again that this new covenant is not only a better covenant, but this is a covenant of which we ought to absolutely take as much advantage as we can. We ought to embrace the new covenant fully. We ought to be careful that we do not ignore this great salvation or drift from this salvation or fall away from this salvation. A lot of terms like that in the book of Hebrews. We ought to be careful not to throw away our confidence as we're going to hear later on in the book. Instead, we ought to take full advantage of the covenant that God has given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to live as, as, as 100% Christian followers. Could you say amen? So the book of Hebrews teaches us the urgency of hanging on, holding on, and entering fully into this covenant that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ, this awesome covenant. Let me just say to you this evening, That as Christian believers, we ought never to allow ourselves to get to the place where we are no longer impressed with and excited about our salvation in Jesus. Could I have a better amen? Amen. Because you know when you live in a certain thing for, you know, half of your life, most of your life, it become, you become accustomed to that thing and sometimes familiarity breeds contempt, or at least familiarity breeds a a casualness and a, a lack of being impressed. And as Christians, we ought never to allow ourselves to get to the place we are where we are no longer impressed with Jesus and excited about our salvation. I'll tell you, we ought to be careful always to maintain a shout in the Lord. Could I have an amen? Where we get to the place where we just are so thrilled with Jesus that we are praising Him, thanking Him, rejoicing Him in Him. We have a dance in our step and a shout in our in our voice and and uh, just a, a thrill in our hearts about who Jesus is. Never drifting away, never falling away, never become becoming bored with our salvation, but staying strong in the Lord. That's what much of the book of Hebrews is about. Now tonight, as we get back into lesson number six for a few moments, we'll go ahead and read the scripture together at Hebrews chapter five, verse 11, and let's read together. 
We have much to say about this, he writes. And what is the this? The this is about the, the high priesthood of Jesus. Jesus is our great high priest. And that's a, that's a complicated theological subject. And the writer of Hebrews says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Everybody say, let's, let's go on to maturity. Okay, No longer babes, but moving toward maturity. So let us, let us go on to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. Instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands. Resurrection of the, de- of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. We're going to go on to those things. It is impossible <coughs> for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance... Because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends... We are confident of better things in your case. In other words, look at me. He's, he's saying, we're, we're confident, readers, church, that you're not going to fall away. That you're not going to become fruitless. That you're not going to drift off and become unproductive Christians. The writer says, we're confident. And I believe he's writing this as, a, as hopeful thinking. As prayerful, hopeful thinking, we're confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him as you have helped His people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Now, let's think for a moment as as we get into, we're going to spend a little extra time in our third point on the outline this evening because we did, the last time Pastor Bob preached from this message, he was not able to get to this portion because this is a long passage of Scripture. So, and and a complicated passage of Scripture. And so, I want to remind you that the first point in this message is about babyish Christians who are not in the Word. Uh, Dave, can we go on to that first point? Babyish Christians who are not in the Word like they should be, who have spent a lot of time in Christianity but have not become mature as they should and are even at the place where they ought to be teaching by now, but they're still in elementary school. Okay, Have you ever known a Christian who maybe serve the Lord for years and years and years, but never became mature. They weren't in the Word. They couldn't quote it. 20 years into serving the Lord, they couldn't quote the Scripture. They ought to be able to be teaching classes by now, but they, they, they've never exercised themselves to become mature Christians. Hear me now. Every Christian believer ought to be regularly growing in the Lord. And listen to me. Growing in the Lord means growing in your knowledge and understanding of Scripture. Yes? Growing in your spiritual fruitfulness. Amen. Working for the Lord. Amen. 
growing in the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay, that means Christians ought to become sweeter as the days go by. More filled with the love of God and the presence of God. And ultimately, growing in the Lord means we become more confident in the Lord. We are peace-filled Christians, joy-filled Christians. We are not easily rattled or turned aside by the things that are going on around about us. We are like, as, as Psalm 1 says, we are like trees planted by the water because our confidence is in the Lord. And so the writer of Hebrews says, many are babyish Christians. But the second main point was, we need to be basic Bible Christians who are informed and who are increasing. We, we are learning regularly and we are growing in the Lord. That's when the writer of Hebrews moves in to one of the most serious passages of Scripture in the book of Hebrews and in all of the Word of God, a passage about falling away. This is where I want to pause for a few moments because, as we said a few weeks ago, the book of Hebrews is obviously written to a generation of Christians, the first century there, and to, to particular Christians who were in danger of falling away from their faith and, 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 and sort of dying out in their salvation. And again and again, the book of Hebrews addresses this. This passage about falling away and the fact that it is impossible. We want to address that term here in a minute. When the writer of Hebrews says, if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. That's a strong word, isn't it? About a backslider. This passage about falling away and the passage in Hebrews chapter 10, which we'll deal with in a few weeks, which says... If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of salvation, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but only the expectation of raging fire. How many of you know what raging fire sounds like? That's hell. That's the judgment of God in hell. So these two passages, this one and the one in chapter 10, are strong passages that say to us, a Christian follower, a follower of Jesus, cannot afford to fall away from his relationship with the Lord. That's what this passage is about, falling away from relationship. And a Christian believer cannot afford to get entangled in sin that continues on willfully in their lives. Now, those are two very distinct conditions in the spiritual life. One condition, falling away from a relationship with God. That's this passage. Chapter 10, getting entangled in sin that continues willfully. Both of those conditions can be fatal to a Christian believer spiritually. So we want to look this evening tonight then for a little, a little more detail, in a little more detail at backsliding Christians. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is not bad news tonight. This is good news. It's a warning to say, keep your relationship with the Lord strong. Ultimately, how many of you want to go to heaven someday? Say, say amen. We want to go to heaven. Now, if I need warnings every now and then to keep me on the straight and narrow so that I'll make it to heaven, then I'm willing to take the warnings. How about you? Okay? So even the warnings in the Word of God are, are good words for us. So let's camp out here in this section for a little bit about backsliding Christians. The first thing we see is a warning about falling from the faith. Falling from the faith. Let's think about the instance of these backsliders. Because, you know, there are, some, there are some evangelicals in the world today who say, well, no, but it's, people can't fall from the faith. People, you know, once saved, always saved, no matter what you do after salvation, you can't fall from the faith. Well, we want to see what the Word... Of, how many of you know we should trust the Word of God before we trust any denominational statement of belief? Okay? The Word of God is our source and our foundation. So let's see what the Word of God has to say. And the Word of God here provides for us an instance of backsliding. 
And we read it here in verse number four. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away. Now, pause with me right there. And how many of you understand this would be a ridiculous passage if it were impossible to fall away? Are you awake? It, this would be a ridiculous discussion if nobody could fall away anyway. Okay? So, if they fall away, it is impossible to be, to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. All right? So, here's the, entrance of some, uh, the, the instance of somebody falling away. Now, the next thing I want you to note about these backsliders here, these faller awayers, is the, the intimacy that these backsliders experienced with the Lord. Because sometimes people will say, well, if they don't stay with the Lord, they must have never really been with the Lord. That's another, the, the once saved, always saved doctrine. They will either, they will say, well, if you're really saved, you can never fall away. And if you, if you do fall away, you must have never been saved in the first place. That's, that's the standard uh, cop out in that discussion. Well, let's think about these people here now who are falling away. Look at how close they had been to the Lord. Verse four, those who have once been what? Or do I have my pointer there, Bill? Thank you, my friend. Let's think, let's think about these words. Those who have once been what? Enlightened. What does the word enlightened mean? It means they've come to the knowledge of the truth. When we think about being enlightened, we think about the light switch being turned on. Okay? You've heard that, that uh, metaphor was like a light switch was turned on. In other words, I came to the realization uh, of what was happening here. They've been, these people, these backsliders uh, to whom, about whom the writer of Hebrews is talking have been enlightened, okay? What else have they done? Everybody say tasted. These are strong verbs. They have tasted the heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift? Here in this passage, it's the gift of salvation. They have tasted the gift of salvation. Remember the, the urging uh, from the scriptures, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because when you taste of the Lord, then you have participated. L listen, how many of you like, um, how many of you like a, a good, strong apple pie? How many of you like an apple pie? I'll tell you, a few weeks ago, Bev Wagner who's, I probably ought not tell this because she might have 40 requests after this. A few weeks ago, Bev Wagner sent with Owen to a board meeting a very special gift for me that she knew I would thoroughly enjoy. Bev Wagner is an expert at making gooseberry pies. How many of you have ever had a, an exquisite Gooseberry pie. Oh, oh my. Most people, you either, you either don't like gooseberry pies at all or you love a gooseberry pie. I had Mark and Nancy back there sample that gooseberry pie from Bev Wagner. And I mean, it was a, it was the real deal gooseberry pie. And I want you to know how many of you understand uh, how many of you have tried a gooseberry pie? Let me see your hand. How many of you? How many of you who have tried a gooseberry pie would acknowledge with me that it only takes a little bitty taste of a gooseberry pie to see what it's all about? Yeah. Because a gooseberry pie is strong. It is strong and it is unique. And when you, when you take a bite of a gooseberry pie, you have tasted and you know you know what's what. Bev, if you're watching tonight, well done, good and faithful servant. Good stuff. Well, the, these people who are backsliding now, they have not only been enlightened, but they have tasted the heavenly gift. They have, have participated in salvation. 
and enjoyed that. Look at the third description. They have not only been enlightened and tasted, they have what? They have shared in the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit, the presence and the power and the sharing in the Holy Spirit is only for Christian believers. Do you remember when Jesus in the gospel said, new wine has to be put into what kind of wineskins? New wineskins. You can't put new wine in old wineskins, Jesus taught. And Jesus was clearly teaching us that the new wine of the Holy Spirit could not be put in old wineskins. The wineskin had to be renewed. The person has to be renewed and saved, a new creation in Christ Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the Holy Spirit only lives in Christian believers? Say amen. That's a clear and plain principle of the scriptures. And these backsliders, they've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. And they have what? Tasted the goodness of the what? The word of God. Not only that, but of the powers of what? What in the world does that mean? Well, we know what it means they have tasted of the Word of God. What does it mean they have tasted the powers of the coming age? That means they have tasted, what I believe that means, they have tasted spiritual power that is going to accompany the realities that we experience for eternity. I believe maybe the clearest understanding of what the powers of the coming age are would be that they have experienced resurrection power. Okay, if there's, if there's any power that marks the coming age for Christian believers, it's resurrection power that ultimately brings from the death of this old world, the death of human bodies, the the death of creation, and brings those things into the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. And to, to taste the powers of the coming age means that you have experienced real, life-giving, spiritual power. Now, now, how many of you can understand here, you see why I've wanted to take a little more time on the, these scriptures here. How many, say this again, enlightened? Say tasted the heavenly gift? Say shared in the Holy Spirit? Say tasted the goodness of the word of God? Say tasted the powers of the coming age? How many of you can understand by looking at at the powerful descriptions that the writer of Hebrews gives here about the salvation experience? Because that's what this is. This is the salvation experience. How many of you here tonight have been enlightened? Say amen. How many of you have tasted the heavenly gift? Say amen. How many of you have shared in the Holy Spirit? Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you have tasted of the Word of God? And how many of you know that the resurrection power of Jesus has worked in your life to bring you from spiritual death to spiritual life? Say amen. Amen. That is the salvation experience right there. So for someone to say, well, if they, if they drift off and fall away, they never really, really were saved. No, no, that's not what this passage is talking about. That, this is talking about people who have experienced a real deal salvation. Their lives have been, have been powerfully impacted by the salvation experience. So when we talk about the intimacy of these backsliders, we're saying these people whom the writer is talking about falling away, they have really known the Lord. Now, how many of you know that if you really know the Lord, only a fool would turn away from who the Lord really is? I'm telling you, only a dummy would taste Bev Wagner's gooseberry pie and say, no, thank you, ma'am. Once you've tasted how good it is, you got to have more. Could I have an amen? amen? And you know what? 
Even when we, we might talk about flavors in, in beautiful pies, there's nothing like the salvation experience that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody who has a good dose of Jesus would have to acknowledge there's nothing better. Amen. Huh? Lift your hand right now and say, thank you, Lord, for your powerful salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We praise you and we love you tonight. Uh, say to the Lord, Lord, I treasure my salvation. Just say that to the Lord. Lord, I treasure my salvation. All right, so back to the scripture now. These backsliders have really known the Lord. And notice then the, in notice then the third point here, the intensity of the insult by these backsliders. Look at the scripture. Verse 6 says, They are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Think about this passage here. How many of you understand that betrayal by someone you have really known and loved is excruciatingly painful? How many of you know, how many, anybody here, we won't take, certainly, certainly won't take time to dig into it, but how many of you have ever experienced what it feels like to be betrayed by someone whom you loved and who loved you? Anybody know what it is to experience real betrayal? Betrayal. I taught for, for years, I taught a class for our, our uh, ministers at the district uh, office, uh, in their credentialing process on ministerial ethics. And a part of that class on ministerial ethics dealt with dealing with betrayal in the ministry and how betrayal has the power absolutely to kill you. Because betrayal can breed bitterness and anger and unforgiveness and hatred like nothing else if we let that betrayal take root in our spirits. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Betrayal is so excruciatingly painful. Well, in the scripture we have before us tonight, the betrayal of falling away from a relationship with Jesus when it has been so intimate as we've talked about tonight, when it has been so close, betrayal is is a painful insult to the Lord Jesus, almost as if they are crucifying the Son of God all over again. And what? Subjecting Him to public disgrace. Because after all, if you have a powerful, passionate relationship with Jesus, and you walk away from that and fall away from that, I'll tell you, the people around you know that. Huh? And, and, and it's, it's as if you're saying, well... I, I, I used to love Jesus, but he's not all that. Can you imagine yourself saying that? Well, I used to love Jesus, but he's not all that. That's what this is. This is someone who is really close... And then falls away, and everybody knows it, and the testimony you're providing about Jesus is, well, I, I'm not, I don't care that much about that anymore. When what you're really saying, says the writer of Hebrews, is, well, I don't really care that much about him anymore. That's, that's, that's rough and tough, isn't it? But, but that's, that's what this is about. You know, that, uh, that's, that's like, I, I, I'm not trying to make things, you know, too light by referring to my pie illustration, but that's, that's like me, you know, falling in love with Bev's gooseberry pie and then saying, well, I used to like that, but, oh, I don't care, Bev, I don't care about, I don't really like that anymore. What an insult, even on a pie. Bev, I want you to know, I love your gooseberry pie to this day. And Jesus, I want you to know, I love you, Jesus, to this day. 
I've served you, Jesus, all of my life. I, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was a five-year-old little boy, as, as best as I can remember. I'm 56 year old, years old today. I want you to understand this evening, it is my testimony that Jesus keeps getting better and better and better. He's as good and better today than he's ever been. I love the Lord Jesus as much today as I've ever loved him. I'm as impressed with the gift of salvation as I ever was when some fancy preacher preached about the old rugged cross. I love the Lord Jesus. He is the best thing that ever happened to me. And, 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 and we don't want to get to the place ever where we are falling away. So we see the, here it is on the scripture, the intimacy of these backsliders, the intensity of the insult inflicted by these backsliders. Look at the next words. And this, these are words that I'm going to have to leave with the Lord to some degree tonight. Because verse number, look at the impossibility for these backsliders. This is a strong word in the scripture. Verse 4 says, it is impossible if they fall away to be brought back to repentance. It is impossible if they fall away to be brought back to repentance. Now, you say, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, all I can, all I can, I know this, that God loves backsliders and God chases after the prodigal son, amen? amen. He chases after the prodigal son. But I believe there is a point where if someone has abandoned their faith in the Lord to such a degree and they have hardened their heart to such a degree, I believe it, it, it may be impossible, not, not because of God, because God loves and doesn't want anyone to perish. Are you with me on that? But I think it can come to the place where it, is imp it becomes impossible to bring them back to a place of repentance and relationship because they have hardened their hearts to such a degree that they will not hear and return. And you know what, friends? I believe, we'll, and we'll look at it in, in uh, chapter 10 when we talk about that continuing in sin passage. I believe there, there, there comes a place where it is possible for a person to so reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit, so fervently decline the invitations of the Lord to come back to relationship, that they've just hardened their hearts where they have, they have made up their mind and they are not going to change. And they have fallen away and they are gone. They are gone. And, and so when we read here about the fact that it's impossible if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, we just understand that there is a, there is a place. And I, I can't define it. I can't put my finger on the place. But there is a place where God determines. This is Holy Scripture before us. Where God determines they're not going to come back. After all, God knows the hearts of every man, doesn't he? He knows the hearts of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. And there's a place where God says, they're, they're gone, and they're not coming back. Oh. Can I tell you that I know people right now that I am afraid for because of these very scriptures? They have so turned against the Lord that they would even curse the Lord and deny the, everything they ever believed with, a, with an anger, a scary place to be. And then we look at the injury to these backsliders. That's the last point in this warning. And verse 6 says, all of this when they fall away and do all this, it's to their loss. And ultimately, friends, it's not just to their earthly loss, it's to their eternal loss. Wouldn't it be an absolute tragedy to be heir to the family fortunes of heaven and then to walk away from it all? Oh, tragic to think about that. So here we have right in the middle of a book written to Christians, 
the book of Hebrews, this very strong warning about the very real possibility for a person who has really known the Lord to fall away and to fall away for good. Whew. Isn't that scary? Everybody say, not me. Not me. Say, no, never. No, never. In Jesus' name. Well, you say, well, how do I keep from even, how do I, how do I guarantee myself? Just, just love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Just walk with the Lord. It's, you know, I, I, I grew up with a little, little lady named uh, Sister Sadie Roark in our church. Some of you remember Sister Roark. She, she was grandmother to Kathy, who plays our piano, and, and to some others in our church family. And Kathy and, and uh, Sister, Sister Roark would, would always quote a scripture. She would testify and she'd say, I'm, I'm, I'm having a good life living for the Lord. She said, the way of the transgressor is hard, but my way is blessed in the Lord. She would always quote that scripture. It's, she'd say, it's not my life as a Christian believer that's hard. It's the way of the transgressor that's hard. What was she saying? We know that as Christians, our lives get hard sometimes too. But I want you to know, it's a whole lot better serving the Lord Jesus and living for Him. That's the best life. And, and just, just stick with the Lord. Because to fall away from Jesus is the most tragic error in life. Now let's look to the next section here as we think about these backsliding Christians. Be warned about falling from the faith. I might only get through this. I might not get to lesson seven tonight unless we are willing to stay till 930. Nobody's very excited about that potential, are they? All right. Let's think about this, this warning then, an illustration about the fruitfulness or fruitlessness of a field. And uh, Pastor Bob mentioned this part last week. Fruitful fields are blessed. Land that drinks in the rain off, often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. Fruit, everybody say fruitful fields are blessed. But on the other hand, fruitless fields are burned. Land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Now, Jesus told a parable on one occasion about a tree that would not bear any fruit. And the, the gardener came and, and he said, I'm going to dig that up. I'm done with that. And somebody said, well, give it another chance. Fertilize it. Let's give it another chance. And if it bears fruit, good. But if it is a worthless tree, then go ahead and get rid of it. And you know, Jesus taught us in that, that God is patient. He, he works with us, and He wants us to be fruitful and to be living in Him. He's, our God is a merciful God. He is not quick to, to cut anyone off. He desires that, and He works. How many of you would say, the Lord has certainly worked with me through the years? Yeah. He certainly worked with us. We haven't always been the best at everything. Sometimes we have flopped and failed. But the, the Lord has, has worked with us. And so let's let him work. Could, could you say amen? Let's let him work. So we have this, this warning to backsliding Christians. And the writer closes with this word about being better than all of that. Better Christians, and he says that good deeds accompany salvation. That includes Christian benevolence. Verse 9, even though we speak like this, giving you all these warnings, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. So he says, we, don't, we believe you're not going to fall away. Some have fallen away, but we believe you're going to hear this warning. And, and take note, and that you're going to rise up. Your life's going to be marked by Christian benevolence, good works, and the consequential blessings that follow that. Verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So good deeds accompany salvation. And here's the, here's the last note, and this has to do with that, that 
with that warning about falling away, great diligence assures salvation. Let me look over to the text column there. Okay? Look over to the text column. Let's read verses 11 and 12 together. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your what? Hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. In other words, if you want, if you want to enter into the, the hope that we have in Jesus and inherit the promises and the blessings of God, then ultimately you need to be diligent about your salvation. You need to be a serious follower of Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? amen. You need to not ignore As Hebrews chapter 2 said, don't ignore this great salvation. Be diligent about this salvation because great diligence assures that you're going to, to, to do that to the very end. So, imitate the productive and the patient. There it is. We want you to show the same diligence. How long? Look up here with me. We want each of you to show the same diligence. How long? To the very end. In order to make your hope sure, okay? Imitate the productive and the patient. And lastly, inherit the promises of God. Listen to how the scripture says it here. It it says, we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. The promises of God are many. They culminate in the promise of eternal life. Isn't that right? And if you want to inherit what has been promised, then you're going to do that through faith and patience. You're going to do that by being diligent about your relationship with the Lord and determining in your heart that you're going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly to the very end. How many of you, that's your determination tonight? Say amen. All right, let's stand together, everybody, this evening. I think we'll stop right there. We dare not start another outline tonight. Next Wednesday night, we'll get to this next outline, number seven, which is about the hope that we have in Jesus as an anchor that reaches into heaven. A beautiful passage about our hope that's anchored in heaven. And so many beautiful songs have been written about that. One of my favorite songs from maybe 20 years ago, The Anchor Holds, Though the Ship is Battered. Remember that old song? How the anchor holds. One of my favorite hymns from days gone by, I've anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll brave. Well, hope, our hope in Jesus is an anchor that holds us secure and sure in Jesus. We'll get to that next next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Tonight, We make our determination and our stand to say we're going to serve Jesus wholeheartedly. We're going to be diligent. Could I say hear an amen? Amen. We're going to we're we're not going to be lazy in our Christian life. Would you say amen? amen? We're we're going to have faith and hold on to it. Could you say amen? We're going to be diligent to the very end. And we're going to receive what has been promised. Now, I want us to pray as we get ready to leave tonight for those who right now have known the Lord and have fallen away. Do you know somebody like that? I know there's somebody's in my heart right now that I believe is in a very, very dangerous spiritual place because of their attitude toward what used to be precious to them. I I want us right now just to take a moment of quiet prayer right now before the Lord, praying for those who are in the midst of or who have fallen away. Maybe you know somebody who has just been slipping, slipping, slipping away from their first devotion to Christ. You know, look at me, friends. I don't even want us to get to a place where we're not as close to the Lord as we, was, as we were last year. That, that, that speaks of neg- n- negative backward movement. How many of you know you certainly don't want to move backward for very long? 
so you know, there are some who have, have been slipping back in their relationship with the Lord. They are drifting. I talked to my friend Randy Hurst last night about some scriptures. And uh, actually, I did talk to him last night. Talked to him again this morning. We talked about that word drifting that we saw a few, few weeks ago in the book of Hebrews. And Randy said to me, he said, you know what? You don't have to do anything to drift. Now think about that. You don't have to do anything to drift. A boat just drifts by doing nothing. You see what I'm saying? If we abandon our diligence, we begin to drift. The Christian life and following Jesus demands and deserves our priority attention. Isn't that right? Amen. And so let's take a moment to bow our heads right now and somebody's in your heart. Just speak their name quietly to the Lord, maybe even under your breath tonight, to, to pray that God will move upon those who are drifting and backsliding, those who maybe have fallen away from the Lord. We pray, oh God. For a fresh, oh Lord, a fresh chasing by your Holy Spirit in their lives. We pray, oh God, that you would soften their hearts and put people into their lives, oh Lord. We ask, we know, Lord, you love them more than we do. And you, you do everything you can do, Lord. You do everything, Lord, that, that, that you know should be done. But Father, we even yield ourselves, oh God, to you. For your use in the process, oh God. That's a big commitment, friends. But, but perhaps maybe the Lord would use us in some of those situations. Lord, take us and help us. Give us boldness and courage. And give us sweetness and kindness and the love of Christ, oh Lord. That we need to be used by you in, in bringing back those who have fallen away. Help us, Lord, we pray. Jesus' name. Now, just right now, let's change, uh, let's change our focus for just a minute. And let's take a moment right now to thank the Lord for this absolutely priceless salvation that we have in Jesus. How many of you would agree with me on that? Let's thank the Lord for this priceless salvation that we have in Jesus. And let's pledge our lives to treat it as the greatest treasure in our lives from this day forward, our relationship with Jesus. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the precious gift of new life through Jesus Christ, the power of your Holy Spirit, the goodness of the Word of God, the fellowship we have with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O Lord, for, for even giving us a taste of the powers of the coming age. With resurrection life, Lord, that we enjoy and experience. Lord, help us, I pray, in the name of Jesus, to be Christian believers who follow you and love you with all of our hearts, O oh Lord. Putting you first always, Lord. And loving you more than we love anything else in this world. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Oh, sing this with me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Love me. Here's the verse I like. To me, he is so wonderful. To me, he is so wonderful. To me, he is so wonderful. Because he first Love me now. Just one more time. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love 
Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Amen. Amen. I know that you love him. Amen. All right, let's go in that joy tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.